Well, welcome and thank you for being here today. For those of you that I have not met, my name is Jody Jensen and I teach over in the English department. And so I've been tasked with a little bit of an introduction, but to say that this introduction will present a brief history of Japanese literature as a whole would absolutely be untrue. Because trying to encapsulate such a history in a brief 10 minutes would be a discredit to the long, complex, and absolutely beautiful history of Japanese literatures. A history that began in oral traditions and was later recorded by and became a pastime of the imperial court, the elite. A history of words that during the medieval times is marked by a strong influence of Buddhism, civil wars, and the rise of a warrior class. This last shift, perhaps, is one of the greatest triumphs for literature, for words, for ideas. Because the function of literature as a means of social intercourse broadened. So in the Edo period, which is roughly 1600 to 1868, Japan saw rising literacy rates. And the poetic form of renga, or linked verse, um, became very popular. And it's here in literary history in Japan that I would like for us to pause this evening as we get started. Renga is actually the precursor for the well-known Japanese poetic form of haiku. And it had once been practiced in the imperial courts and amongst low-ranking monks, the latter often completing their work, quote unquote, under the blossoms, meaning of course, under the cherry trees which for many of us situated in the West is a very familiar and distinct image of Japan. However, it is also at this point in literary history that this poetic work slipped into the hands of lower class citizens. And the poetic form encouraged poets, everyday poets, to work in pairs or small groups taking turns composing the alternating three-line and two-line stanzas. So as you saw earlier, we walked around and we had some handouts. And for those joining us online today, please bear with us for a little while. Um, the handout in front of you has a linked verse. It's a very um, famous one. And I'd like to read it to you. There's two versions. The first is the more traditional, and we can see the Renga form. So in English, it begins, resenting the early summer rains, smoke rises in faint trails from the brine boiler's hut on the coast. Dimly, far away, the pine has faded into dusk. When was it that I waited by myself till morning in the vain hope you would come? Now, what you'll notice on one side, for those of you who are present today in the auditorium, is that we see three different names under each of these stanzas in the left-hand column. This means we have three different poets contributing to this. Now, some of the debates for Ranga, because we like to do that in literary studies, um, talk about how each of these stanzas could actually stand on their own, that they wouldn't need the lines that follow. But what becomes interesting about this particular poetic form is that it does link together and a different conversation emerges out of all of these different stanzas. We see that in the second version in front of you. This is an alternative translation. And when we get here is a translator actually putting these together. They don't look much like a Ranga, but it does stem from this. And it reads differently. Resenting the early summer rains, smoke rises in faint trails from the brine boiler's hut on the coast. Dimly, far away, the pine has faded into dusk. Dimly, far away, the pine has faded into dusk. When was it that I waited by myself till morning in the vain hope you would come? We get two very different poems out of this. The first suggesting that there's a sense of independence between the stanzas, and the second saying, maybe, but there's also a link. There's a shared conversation at work. 
a basic Renga, and this is um, also on your handouts today, usually has some kind of form that's a two or three line written by a first author or poet. And then a partner finishes the stanza by adding two more lines. You'll notice in the poem that we just read, both versions or translations, and the one in front of you, the raven's dark wings row the air like feathered oars, each tree a harbor. Beneath a tall cypress tree, I drop anchor for a while. There's of course a lot of natural imagery in both of these. It might be a little bit of a stereotype to say that this is traditionally Japanese because of course it's not, we all work with nature, but it's familiar. And this is actually one of the more popular um, types of approaches. It's something we observe, something we observe. The result of a Renga poem does not have to be serious. Obviously these, these are. These are very beautiful, um, a lot of nature, a lot of strong imagery. They can also be super silly. So I do want to give us a couple minutes. Um, if you look on the back of your sheet, and those of you at home can also follow along in terms of writing two or three lines about something you have observed. It could be your teacher. Maybe you were really fascinated with your teacher's shoes today because they wear them every single day. We do own more, I promise, but sometimes we get lazy. Okay. Um, it can be super silly or it can be serious. We have a beautiful autumn day outside today. So it could be something you observed walking over here today or headed home. And then you can find a partner. And for those of you who are at home, um, you can certainly try a solo Ranga. It works the same. And that is part of a contemporary tradition of this poetic form. Um, but just start those two to three lines. And then for those of you present, you can find someone sitting next to you. Once you've finished the first two to three lines, exchange your papers and then finish off um, those last two lines of the stanza. Make sense? Okay. So take just a couple minutes. Um, and as you're thinking through this, traditional Ranga usually follows a 575 syllable pattern but contemporary uses of the poetic form have dropped that aside because they want more wiggle room. So you can try doing something traditional with it, or you can just take it in a contemporary direction and write about something you observe, not even thinking about that. Looks like many of, many of you present have gotten through your first three lines. So then you can exchange with a partner. They'll read it um, and then they'll add the last two lines.
All right, do we have one or two that we feel like are complete, either solo or with partners? Who's feeling brave? I saw some, so I can just walk over. And... The joy of being a teacher, right? Don't read them. Don't read, don't read that. <laughs> <laughs> I can follow some direction. No, no, how about over here? We can? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you for being brave. Thank you for the brave souls because you weren't expecting to actually do homework um, on the spot, I'm sorry. All right, so the first one that we have is Reflect on Moonlight. Story boulders, stony, sorry, I'm gonna read well. Stony boulders and raging ball, balls, falls? Falls, thank you, falls. Call on the rising moon to maintain flow and equilibrium. That's good. The second today, Red foliage on the ground reminds me of you. Sad, beautiful, strong. When did we last meet together? Unrestrained, laughing, us. Y'all be poets. Thank you for sharing those. Very brave. Um, by looking at the Renga, my hope today was that we see a form of writing that reminds us that texts are to be participatory. So though we did not make it in this introduction to all of the time periods of Japanese literary history, as we move into the readings this evening, we might all, myself included, do well to consider not simply what the texts say, or even how they sound, or the familiar images that we might associate with Japan, but rather how we can participate with them, both as listeners present and on Zoom, and as readers. And I will return these sheets um, to the appropriate people to make sure that you have an opportunity as noted on the bottom to think about the introduction and then write down some notes, some participatory notes from what you observe in the readings that are to follow. So having said all of this, thank you again for being here today. And I have the great pleasure of introducing Maya Strict, who will start our journey of Japanese readings for this evening. All right, Maya. Okay, I'm short. Oh no. Good, okay. I'm far less eloquent than Dr. Jensen is, so you'll have to bear with me on that. Um, but good evening, yeah, so. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Maya Strick. I'm a double major in English and French. I'm secretary of MSSU's chapter of Sigma Tau Delta, um, vice pre president of Better Strangers, which is our literary um, medieval group here on campus. And recently, I'm also an editor of Border Town, so I keep busy. But when I do find time to myself. Um, a lot of times I tend to look to Japanese originating um, pastimes. So things that we all know probably like anime and manga, um, as well as like, for example, I went to Sakura today and I ate udon and that's one of my favorite like Japanese comfort foods. Um, I'll play Animal Crossing or Pokemon. And I think that there are a lot of Japanese things that are within our daily lives that we don't think about. So um, I've always kind of been fascinated by Japanese culture, um, just personally and academically. And kind of as a language nerd, I think that we can learn a lot from literature. That's something that I really love um, about my degree. I'm interested in ancient texts. Um, and that is actually what I'll be reading for you tonight. So my first texts that um, we'll be looking at are actually a few texts, and we're beginning with poetry by and about Jito Tenno. So she was born Princess Uno no Sorara. Um, her name, um, Jito Tenno, that is um, sort of elected when you become 
a royal official in Japanese government. Um, so Empress Shito was Japan's 41st monarch. She was only the third empress and she lived during the second half of the seventh century. So that's like um, 1650s to 700-ish. And the, sexual, the selection that I'm reading today was translated by Jeffrey Bonus, as well as Anthony Thwaite. And so I have two short poems by Empress Jito herself, um, a response to her second poem, as well as a poem about her. This poem does not have a title. So um, for those types of poems, for those of you who don't know, um, it's typically just the first line that's the title. So, has spring passed away? Has spring passed away? Did summer already come? Lo Kaguyama, there the white gowns are being seen dried. And here's the second poem by Empress Shito. On the old lady she, no, no, I say, to she's far-fetched tales. Still, she insists. For a time, I have not heard them, and now I long for them. This is a reply to that poem. No, no, I say, but still you command, tell on, tell on. So I fetch out one more, and you say far-fetched. This poem is titled In Praise of Empress Jito. Our great empress who rules in tranquility, true God of true God, has done a divine thing deep in the valley of Yoshino's foaming torrents. She builds high her tall place. She climbs and looks across her lands, the mountain folds like green walls as offerings from their deity. When spring comes, bring cherry garlands. When autumn begins, they bring crim crimson leaves. The river spirit too makes gifts of sacred food. In the upper shoals, he sets the cormorants. In the lower shallows, he spreads small nets. Mountain and river too come near and serve this godlike land. So that was Empress Jito. And then the second and final author whose work that I'm reading this evening is that of Yamanue Okura, who lived also um, during the late seventh century um, as well as the early eighth century. He um, often concerned himself with a mix of Confucian inspired morality as well as um, Buddhist resignation quite a bit. And the poem that I'm reading today is called A Dialogue on Poverty, and it was translated by Donald Keene. <clears throat> A Dialogue on Poverty. On the night when the rain beats, driven by the wind, on the night when the snowflakes mingle with the sleety rain, I feel so helplessly cold. I nibble at a lump of salt, sip the soft, oafed, diluted dregs of sake, and coughing, snuffling, and stroking my scanty beard, I say in my pride, there's none worthy save I. But I shiver still with cold. I pull up my hempen bedclothes, wear what few sleeves, sleeveless clothes I have, but cold and bitter is the night. As for those poorer than myself, their parents must be cold and hungry. Their wives and children beg and cry. Then how do you struggle through life? Why does they call the heaven and earth? For me, they have shrunk quite small. Bright through, though they call the sun and the moon, they never shine for me. Is it the same with all men or for me alone? By rare chance, I was born a man and no meaner than my fellows, but wearing unwatted sleeveless clothes in tatters like weeds waving in the sea hanging from my shoulders and under the sunken roof within the leaning walls. Here I lie on straw spread on bare earth with my parents at my pillow, my wife and children at my feet, all huddled in grief and tears. 
No fire sends up smoke at the cooling place, and in the cauldron, a spider spins its web with not a grain to cook. We moan like the night thrush, then to cut, as the saying is, the ends of what is already too short. The village headman comes with rod in hand to our sleeping place, growling for his dues. Must it be so hopeless, the way of this world? Nothing but pain and shame in this world of men, but I cannot fly away, wanting the wings of a bird. That's Yamanoe Okura. And next, I believe Haley is reading. So this is Haley Stamper. Hi, um, my name is Haley. Uh, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a junior here at MSSU and I'm majoring in art education. Um, some extracurriculars I'm a part of include, I'm the treasurer of Sigma Tau Delta, president of the Art Education Club Lay Art, treasurer of GSA, captain of the marching band color guard team and part of the honors program. The excerpt I'll be reading tonight is from the book, The Tale of Jinji. It was written by Murasaki Shikabu about 1001 to 1014 Central Era and translated by Dennis Washburn in 2021. Um, Murasaki Shikabu is a created name. The author's real name is unknown. She lived from 973 to 1014 in Kyoto, Japan. She was born into a lesser branch of the Fujiwara family, a highly influential family of the Japanese aristocracy at the time. Um, the novel includes 54 chapters describing the character Jinji and his legacy. The tale of Jinji was Japan's most celebrated work of fiction for nearly a millennia before it was recognized as a major work of world literature in the last century. Many consider the tale of Jinji to be the world's first novel. The translator Dennis Washburn has a PhD in Japanese liter language and literature from Yale University. He is the Burlington Northern Foundation Professor of Asian Studies at Dartmouth College. He has been the author and editor of a number of studies of cultural and literary topics for which he was awarded the US Japan Foreign Commission Prize. And he was also awarded the Japan Foreign Minister's Citation in 2004. Um, so here is the tale of Jinji. On the emotion of the person viewing the scene, the ineffable beauty of the dawn could be either sadly overpowering or lustrously elegant. Jinji's emotions, which he could share with no one, were causing him distress. And when he at last got up to leave, he could not resist the urge to keep glancing back at her, knowing there was no reliable way to exchange messages. Jinji's return to the household of his father-in-law um, Jinji returned to the household of his father-in-law, but the afterglow of the affair kept him awake. It would not be easy to meet the young wife again, and that realization brought on pangs of sympathy for the woman who, he imagined, was likely suffering even more than he. Though not truly exceptional, she certainly belonged to that middle-level type he and the other young gentlemen had discussed that rainy evening. Attractive and gracefully modest, she perfectly matched the description that the warden, a man of experience, had given them that night. Jinji began to spend all of his time at his father-in-law's residence. He was in a constant state of anxiety, however, since there was no word about the young wife, and he wondered what he might, she might be thinking. Unable to stand it any longer, he summoned the governor of Key and made a request. May I take into service that handsome lad we discussed, you know, the son of the late captain, he had a rather endearing air about him, and I'd like to have him in my personal retinue. I shall present him to the emperor myself. You are far too gracious, my lord, replied the governor. I shall have your request relayed to his older sister, that is, to my stepmother. Jinji felt his heart rise in his chest. Has the boy's sister, he required, given you any, inquired, <laughs> given you any siblings? No, she has no children, the governor answered. She's been married to my father for two years, but I've heard she's quite dissatisfied. 
Evidently, she regrets going against her father's wish that she serve at court. What a pity, said Genji. She has a good reputation. Is she really as beautiful as they say? She's probably not all that bad looking, but I don't actually know since I'm not very close to her. As a stepson, custom demands that I keep my distance. Five or six days after this ex exchange, the governor brought the boy to Genji. Though the lad was not, strictly speaking, handsome in all respects, he nevertheless presented a fresh, graceful appearance. Genji called the boy in and spoke to him with an easy familiarity. For his part, the boy was overjoyed, sensing in his youthful heart that he was in the presence of someone remarkable. Genji asked him for details about his older sister, the young wife of Ayo. The boy attempted to answer as best he could, but he was so proper in his bearing that Genji felt um, reticent, lest he present, press his questions too far. It was difficult to ask the boy to be his messenger without divulging his affair with the boy's sister. Still in the end, Genji succeeded in conveying just what he wanted. And though the boy was surprised when he vaguely caught on to what Genji was requesting, he was still innocent enough that he did not fully grasp all the implications. Thus, when he del delivered Genji's letter, he was stunned to see tears well up in his sister's eyes. Humiliated that her younger brother might know what had transpired, she held out the letter and unrolled it so that it hid her face. Genji had written a great deal. If our eyes shall never meet, I have no hope of seeing you on the other nights in my dreams, since nights spent longing for you bring me no sleep. As the poet put it, because of sleepless nights, I cannot dream of you. So what comfort does my love for you bring? It was a dazzling letter and she could hardly stand reading it. Blinded by her tears, she lay prostrate, pondering these events that had brought a new and unexpected twist of fate into her life. The following day, Genji summoned the boy who then informed his sister that he was to go to Genji's residence. When her brother asked for her response letter, she told him, inform your Lord that there was no one here to take the letter from you. The boy smiled and replied, how can I tell him that? He told me to make sure I delivered it with no mistakes. His answer darkened her mood since she could only assume that her younger brother knew everything that happened that night. Her anguish knew no limits. Very well, she said in a fit of pique. If you're so smart, then don't go at all. How can I not go when I've been summoned, he said and left. The governor of Ki, a man of amorous inclinations, was attracted to his young stepmother and thought her beauty was wasted on his elderly father. In order to get on her good side, he made a fuss over the younger brother and took him along everywhere he went. Genji called the boy to him and said, I waited all day yesterday for you. Apparently, I'm not in your thoughts as much as you are in mine. The boy blushed upon hearing Genji express his resentment in this way. So where do things stand? Genji continued, and the boy had to explain the situation. So my request was in vain. She's being much too difficult, Genji said, giving the boy another letter. You probably have no idea about us, do you? Before she married the old vice governor of Ayo, your sister had been meeting me. However, she came to look on me as some unreliable, thin-necked youth, and so turned for support to that inelegant old man. Now she seems to be making a fool of me. But even so, I want you to be a son to me. After all, the old man she depends upon isn't long for this world. When he learned about this earlier affair of a, between Genji and his sister, the boy was quite taken with the story, which struck him as splendidly romantic. Genji found his reaction charming. Um, I'm sorry, remind me of your name. Peter, Peter will be next. <laughs> I think you wanna take a page out, there, out of Dr. Jensen's book and actually do a timer as well, just to play it safe here. All right, so good evening. My name is Peter, and I'm a secondary education major with a focus in English and a certificate in linguistics. I was born and raised in Chicago, moving to the Joplin area in early 2019. I'm a fifth year student and the president of Better Strangers, a book club that covers English, early English and medieval English literature. 
My passions are literature, music, and helping students realize their own potential and individualized voices. I'm particularly interested in the natural conceits of Matsuo Basho's poetry. He is especially skilled in his ability to link haikus together to evoke shared symbolism between these poems, emphasizing their unique characteristics as a result. My future plans include working toward a graduate degree in anthropological linguistics, and perhaps even conducts work in the preservation of endangered languages. Matsuo Basho is a renowned poet from the Edo period, which has been stated previously spans from 1603 to 1868. The haikus I'll be presenting were written in the late 17th century and translated by Geoffrey Faunus and Anthony Thwaite. Haikus are 17 syllable poems split between three lines as 575, typically evoking the natural world. Matsuo was born in 1644 in the Iga province, which existed in part of what today is the Western Mia Prefecture. Most of his life's work aimed to demonstrate the literary value of haikus, which at the time had been conceptualized as more of a pastime. Additionally, Matsuo himself claimed that his own worth as an individual was in his work in promoting the no renga form, also known as renku. This form presents a more collaborative approach to poetry, where, poetry, where poets would insert their haikus among others to create a longer work of shared haikus. Matsuo li lives as a teacher, or lived as a teacher, but later left the city to travel around Japan, seeking inspiration for his poems. The following haikus are titled for their initial lines. The sea dark, the call of the teal, dimly white. The cuckoo, its call stretching over the water. On a bare branch, a rook roosts, autumn dusk. Seven sights were veiled in mist, then I heard me temple's bell. The beginning of art, the depths of the country, and a rice planting song. Summer grasses, all that remains of soldiers' visions. Ailing on my travels, yet my dream wandering over withered moors. Spring, a hill without a name, veiled in morning mist. Clouds now and then giving men relief from moon viewing. The beginning of autumn, sea and emerald paddy, both the same green. Silent and still then, even sinking into rocks, the cicadas screech. To the sun's path, the hollyhocks lean in the May rains. Soon it will die, yet no trace of this in the cicadas screech. The winds of autumn blow yet still green, the chestnut hucks, husks. You say one word and lips are chilled by autumn's wind. A flash of lightning into the gloom goes the heron's cry. Still baking down the sun, not regarding the wind of autumn. Thank you. I'd like to invite Hunter up to the podium now. Hello everyone, my name is Hunter Van Valkenburg and I'm a professional and technical writing major with a creative writing certificate. I am a senior. I am also the president of our chapter of Sigma Tau Delta, as well as an editor on Border Town. Uh, after I graduate, I plan to pursue a career as an editor. 
and I've been a big fan of Japanese literature ever since I was young, but I must confess it is more of the modern stuff, <laughs> but I have always loved haiku as well. So I uh, am very excited to share tonight in the rich and varied culture that Japan has and its literature with you all. The story that I'll be reading tonight is called The Wooden Bowl, or Hachi Katsuki, as it is known in Japanese, and it was originally published by Takejiro Hasegawa on November 22nd, Meiji 20, which is about 1887. However, it is considered like a classic fairy tale as well, so it has existed for more time than it has been published for. Uh, the book that it, is it was originally contained in was one of three in the Kobunsha Aino fairy tale series and was distributed across Europe by the Hasegawa publisher. The Wooden Bowl also included illustrations originally done by Tosa Matabe, an artist that was often employed by the Hasegawa publisher. The original translation was most likely requested by Hasegawa as he would often hire prominent Westerners living in Japan to produce works that would be intended for markets outside of Japan. And the translator of this piece is Mrs. T.H. James, who is also known as Kate James, and she is considered the original translator of The Wooden Bowl into English, and was actually known for translating several other Japanese fairy tales into English while she was living in Japan at the request of the Hasegawa Publishing Company. And she was actually born in 1851 uh, in Aberdeenshire, Scotland. Uh, she eventually married Thomas Henry James, for which she's also known as T.H. James, and they moved to Japan where she later had her daughter, Elspeth Iris, awesome name. And some of her other well-known translations are the Masuyama Mirror, uh, the Cub's Triumph, the Ogre's Arm, and several others. So this, so this is uh, the wooden bowl. Once upon a time, there lived an old couple who had seen better days. Formerly, they had been well-to-do but misfortune came upon them through no fault of their own, and in their old age, they had become so poor that they were only just able to earn their daily bread. One joy, however, remained to them. This was their only child, a good and gentle maiden of such wonderful beauty that in all the land she had no equal. At length, the father fell sick and died, and the mother and her daughter had to work harder than ever. Soon the mother felt her strength failing her, and great was her sorrow at the thought of leaving her child alone in the world. The beauty of the maiden was so dazzling that it became the cause of much thought and anxiety to the dying mother. She knew that in one so poor and friendless as her child, it would likely prove to be a misfortune instead of a blessing. Feeling her end to be very near, the mother called the maiden to her bedside, and with many words of love and warning, entreated her to continue pure and good and true as she had ever been. She told her that her beauty was a perilous gift which might become her ruin and commanded her to hide it as much as possible from the sight of all men. That she might do this the better, the mother placed on her daughter's head a lacquered wooden bowl, which she warned her on no account to take off. The bowl overshadowed the maiden's face so that it was impossible to tell how much beauty was hidden beneath it. After her mother's death, the poor child was indeed forlorn, but she had a brave heart and at once set about earning her living by hard work in the fields. As she was never seen without the wooden bowl, which indeed appeared a very funny headdress, she soon began to be talked about and was known in all the country road as the maid with the bowl on her head. Proud and bad people scorned and laughed at her and the idle young men of the village made fun of her, trying to peep under the bowl and even to pull it off her head but it seemed firmly fixed and none of them succeeded in taking it off or in getting more than a glimpse of the beautiful face underneath. The poor girl bore all this rude usage patiently and was always diligent in her work. And when evening came, crept quietly to her lonely home. Now, one day when she was at work in the harvest field of a rich farmer who owned most of the land in that part, the master himself drew near. He was struck by the gentle and modest behavior of the young girl and by her quickness and diligence at her work. Having watched her all that day, he was so much pleased with her that he kept her in work until the end of the harvest. After that, winter having now come on, he took her into his own house to wait upon his wife, who had long been sick and seldom left her bed. Now the poor orphan had a happy home once more, for both the farmer and his wife were very kind to her. As they had no daughter of their own, she became more like the child of the house than a hired servant, 
And indeed, no child could have made a gentler or more tender nurse to a sick mother than, than did this little maid to her mistress. After some time, the master's eldest son came home on a visit to his father and mother. He had been living in Kyoto, the rich and gay city of the Mikado, where he had studied and learned much. Wearied with feasting and pleasure, he was glad to come back for a little while to the quiet home of his childhood. But week after week passed, and to the surprise of his friends, he showed no desire to return to the more stirring life of the town. The truth is that no sooner had he set his eyes on the maid with the bowl on her head than he was filled with curiosity to know all about her. He asked who and what she was and why she was always seen with such a curious and unbecoming headdress. He was touched by her sad story, but could not help laughing at her odd fancy of wearing the bowl on her head. But as he saw day by day, her goodness and gentle manners, he laughed no more. And one day, after having managed to take a sly peep under the bowl, he saw enough of her beauty that made him fall deeply in love with her. From that moment, he vowed that none other than the maid with the bowl should be his wife. His relations, however, would not hear of the match. No doubt the girl was all very well in her way, they said. But after all, she was only a servant and no fit mate for the son of the house. They had always said that she was being, being made too much of and would one day or another turn against her benefactors. Now their words were coming true. And besides, why does she persist in wearing that ridiculous thing on her head? Doubtless to get a reputation for beauty, which most likely she did not possess. Indeed, they were almost certain that she was quite plain looking. The two old maiden aunts of the young man were especially bitter and never lost an opportunity of repeating the hard and unkind things which were said about the poor orphan. Her mistress even, who had been so good to her, now seemed to turn against her, and she had no friend left except her master, who would really have been pleased to welcome her as his daughter, but did not, say as mate, did not dare say as much. The young man, however, remained firm to his purpose. As for all the stories which they brought him, he gave his aunts to understand that he considered them little better than a pack of ill-natured inventions. At last, seeing him so steadfast in his determination, and that their opposition only made him the more obstinate, they were fain to give in, though with a bad grace. A difficulty now arose, where it was least to have been expected. The poor little maid with the bowl on her head upset all their calculations by gratefully, but firmly, refusing the hand of her master's son, and no persuasion on his part could induce her to change her mind. Great was the astonishment and anger of the relations. That they should be made fools of in this way was beyond all bearing. What did the ungrateful young minx expect that her master's son wasn't good enough for her? Little did they know her true and loyal heart. She loved him dearly, but she would not bring discord and strife into the home which had sheltered her in her poverty. For she had marked the cold looks of her mistress and very well understood what they meant. Rather than bring trouble into that happy home, she would leave it at once and forever. She told no one and shed many bitter tears in secret, yet she remained true to her purpose. Then, that night when she had cried herself to sleep, her mother appeared to her in a dream and told her that she might, without scruple, yield to the prayers of her lover and to the wishes of her own heart. She woke up full of joy, and when the young man at once more entreated her, she answered yes with all her heart. We told you so, said the mother and the aunts, but the young man was too happy to mind them. So the wedding day was fixed and the grandest preparations were made for the feast. Some unpleasant remarks were doubtless to be heard about the beggar maid and her wooden bowl, but the young man took no notice of them and only congratulated himself upon his good fortune. Now, when the wedding day had at last come and all the company were assembled and ready to assist at the ceremony, it seemed high time that the bowl should be removed from the head of the bride. She tried to take it off, but found to her dismay that it stuck fast, nor could her utmost efforts even succeed in moving it. And when some of the relations persisted in trying to pull off the bowl, it uttered loud cries and groans as of pain. The bridegroom comforted and consoled the maiden and insisted that they should go on with the ceremony without more ado. And now came the moment when the wine cups were brought in and the bride and bridegroom must drink together the three times three in token that they were now become man and wife. Hardly had the bride put her lips to the sake cup when the wooden bowl burst with a loud noise and fell in a thousand pieces upon the floor. And with the bowl fell a shower of precious stones, pearls and diamonds, rubies and emeralds, which had been hidden beneath it, besides gold and silver in abundance, which now became the marriage portion of the maiden.
But what astonished the wedding guests even more than this vast treasure was the wonderful beauty of the bride, made fully known for the first time to her husband and to all the world. Never was there such a merry wedding with such a proud and happy bridegroom or such a lovely bride. And I will now invite Bailey to come speak. I hate removing this. I feel like I have something on my face every time. <laughs> you guys are far enough away though. So good evening, everybody. So my name is Bailey Harding. I am a junior here at Missouri Southern State University, and I am studying secondary English education. So I am in the honors program here at Missouri Southern. Um, I am an Omicron Delta Kappa Honor Society, and best of all, Sigma Tai Delta. After I graduate, I plan on teaching middle and high schoolers English, and I know many of you think I'm crazy for that, but eventually I hope to receive my master's and education specialist degree to become a school psychologist. So I came from a tiny town of only about a thousand people in southeastern Kansas, and Missouri Southern, especially these theme semesters, has taught me really one big thing. The world is really big. In this Japanese semester, I have encountered texts, ideas, and cultural elements that I never would have considered before coming to MSSU. Reading the literature of different Japanese novelists and authors has been incredibly interesting, and so tonight I am thankful and honored to be reading the works of Yosano Akiko. Yosano Akiko was born on December 7th, 1878 near Osaka, Japan. From a young age, Yosano was very interested in writing and even published a private poetry magazine with her friends. Yosano Akiko married Yosano Takan, who founded a group that Yosano Akiko was a member of that was called the New Poetry Society. In 1912, Yosano spent a year in France with her husband, and a collection of poetry, which is translated from summer to autumn, was written during this period of her life. However, Yosano's poetry was more than just a hobby. It also provided income to her already large and growing family. Yosano gave birth to 13 children, 11 of whom survived. In her lifetime, Yosano published more than 20 collections of poetry, along with multiple volumes of social criticism. Some of Yosano's most famous pieces include Translated, Tangled Hair, 1901, Dream Flowers from 1906, and White Cherry from 1935. Yosano is also known for her work in education reform in Japan, and she established a women's trade school in the country in 1921, where she also served as a teacher. Yosano Akiko passed away on May 29, 1942, at the age of 63. Even today, Yosano Akiko is known for her erotic poetry and her intimate descriptions of sensual and spiritual love. The selections of Yosano Akiko's poetry I will be reading tonight were translated by Kenneth Rexroth in 100 More Poems from the Japanese, published in 1974. I will be reading a selection titled Labor Pains, and then two more short works from Yosano Akiko that exhibit her expressionistic and intimate writing style. This is Labor Pains. I am sick today, sick in my body, eyes wide open, silent, I lie on the bed of childbirth. Why do I, so used to the nearness of death, to pain and blood and screaming, now uncontrollably tremble with dread? A nice young doctor tried to comfort me and talked about the joy of giving birth. Since I know better than he about this matter, what good purpose can his prattle serve? Knowledge is not reality. Experience belongs to the past. Let those who lack immediacy be silent. Let observers be content to observe. I am all alone, totally, utterly, entirely on my own, gnawing my lips, holding my body rigid, waiting on inexorable fate. There is only one truth. I shall give birth to a child, truth driving outward from my inwardness, neither good nor bad, real, no shame about it. With the first labor pains, suddenly the sun goes pale. The indifferent world goes strangely calm. I am alone. It is alone I am. And the next two poems are titled by their initial lines. 
not speaking of the way, not thinking of what comes after, not questioning name or fame. Here, loving love, you and I look at each other. I can give myself to her in her dreams, whispering her own poems in her ear as she sleeps beside me. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, I brought a lot of stuff up here. You know, like gave me a laser pointer and everything. Um, so a brief introduction. My name is Andrew Stores. I'm a senior here at Missouri Southern pursuing a bachelor's degree in English literary studies. I'm thrilled to see everybody here tonight, and I'm even more thrilled to talk about a versatile text with an even more versatile author and illustrator. Takahashi Rumiko was born on October 10th, 1957 in Nagata, Japan. She discovered and pursued her passion as a comic author during university, attending Gekiga Sunjuku, a local school dedicated to manga and its publication. Following her studies and a slew of immediate successes through short story manga publications, such as Time Warp Trouble, Shake Your Buddha, and Golden Gods of Poverty, she became a household name in the world of manga. Her success would only grow from there with innumerable short mangas and manga series being published between the years of 1980 to 2019. Takahashi Rumiko has received several awards for the mangas that she has written over the years. Notably, she received the Medal with Purple Ribbon, which is awarded by the Jap Japanese government to individuals who have contributed to academic and artistic developments, improvements, and accomplishments. Currently, she has over 200 million copies of her mangas circulating worldwide that have been translated into over 20 different languages. Um, I've been throwing the word manga around a lot and feel that it needs an explanation for those of you who don't know what it is. Essentially, manga is a comic or a graphic novel originating in Japan. Um, it has its roots in early Japanese art forms and remains as a large part of Japanese culture today. Um, manga reads differently than the comics of the Western world by being read from right to left and top to bottom. I went ahead and brought it with me. Um, so the spine is going to be on the right side. And you'll start here and you will read from, you'll read from right to left and top to bottom. Um, without further ado though, let's set our sights on the reading. Tonight, I will be reading volume one of Inuyasha, being the accursed child. Inuyasha is a manga series written and illustrated by Takahashi Rumiko, translated into English by Mari Morimoto, and first published in November of 1996 by Viz Media. This would be her fourth major work, and it would last for 56 volumes and conclude in June of 2008. During this time, it would be produced as an anime, which is a Japanese animated television show, as well as four standalone anime movies. Um, Inuyasha follows the adventures of Kagome, a 15-year-old schoolgirl that falls into a well and is transported into the Sengoku period, a time in Japan's history that is infamous for strife, civil war, and political intrigue. By referencing Japanese mythology, Feudal politics and a tantalizing quest, Takahashi provides us with one of the most groundbreaking mangas ever written. So now let's go ahead and jump right into it. Okay, so I'll just read it with everyone. Here, I'll go ahead and grab this microphone as well. Okay, um, let's begin. So we start in Tokyo of 1997. The Shikan Jewel. Yes, so long as one has this one's, so long as one has this, one's family will know safety and prosperity. And people actually pay money for these marbles? Here it's legend in Kagome. In the beginning, the jewel of four souls. Save your breath, Gramps. You remember what tomorrow is? Sigh. Could I ever forget my adorable granddaughter's birthday? Wow, for me? It's a day early, but... Happy birthday, Kagome. It's the mummified hand of a Kappa water sprite. The legends hold that whoever possesses this. Here, Buyo, lunch. Do you know what those cost? My house is also a very old shrine. The legend of these pickles is that 
you bought them from Mr. Ujiko, right? There's a sacred Goshinboku god tree that's 500 years old and a covered well that probably has its own legend. In fact, everything at my house has a legend, but see ya. No matter how many times Gramps tells them to me, in the beginning, this, I always forget. I never even thought about trying to remember them until the day I turned 15 today. Hey, Soda, sis, you're not supposed to play in the mini shrine, but Booyo, he's in the well house? Booyo, he's somewhere down there, so go get him out. But doesn't this place kind of give you the creeps? What, you scared? You're a boy, aren't you? Th there's something in there, like, oh, say, our cat? Jeez, huh? It's coming from inside the well? You're kidding me. Don't yell like that. You scared me, you little. <laughs> Kagome. And she falls into the well. No, this can't be. What joy, what strength I feel. My flesh returns to me. You have it, yes? Let me go, you freak. I will not lose it now. The jewel of four souls. Jewel of four. Oh, I'm in the well. Was that thing just a dream? Guess not. I won't lose it now. The jewel of four souls. Jewel of four souls. Now, what did Gramps say again? I, I've got to get out of here. Sota, you there? Go get Gramps now. Chicken, run away, will he? Huh? Where's this? I fell into the well inside the mini shrine, but grandpa, mom, now there was no trace of a shrine. Oh, the old god tree. Even when I was little, I could always find my way home from there. Thank you very much. Um, and I would like to invite uh, Marissa up to the podium. Let's see if I can get this on there first. <laughs> Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Marissa Ball. I'm the vice president of our chapter of Sigma Tau Delta. I'm from the St. Joseph, Missouri area, and I'll graduate in May with an English degree in literary studies, a minor in American history, and certificates in creative writing and linguistics. Um, I have had two short stories published in Reach, which is the now defunct literary journal at Missouri Western State University, which is where I went to school before I came here which was probably the best decision I have made to date. Um, and I also have a non excuse me, a nonfiction piece um, in our own literary journal here on campus called Border Town. After graduation, I will be moving to Manhattan, Kansas, where I will have easy access to the Kansas State University campus should I ever decide to, I don't know, commit to graduate school. Um, so Hunter and I, who read a little bit ago, um, we have been responsible for picking out the pieces that you've heard here tonight. Um, and one thing that I felt that was really important to include was a piece about the aftermath of the atomic bombs that were dropped on Japan. Um, of course, I can't speak for everybody, but I know that for me personally, um, the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki are the first thing that I learned about Japan at all. Um, and as I've gone through college, I've become really aware of the fact um, that we have a tendency to view history, you know, general world history through just a very American lens. Um, and I think it's easy to try to justify wartime actions, but it maybe doesn't come as naturally to consider what kind of intimate and very personal aftermath um, comes from something traumatic like this. Um, so I wanted to include it for that reason, not because this is the event that everybody associates with Japan, but because the bombings did have such a traumatic effect on the country. And I think this story illustrates that really well. So the story I'm about to read is from the short story insects it's just a little bit it's a lot longer and i didn't want to keep you guys here all night so um and it's called insects it's written by um 
Sora Yuichi and translated by Paul Warham. I found this in the Penguin Book of Japanese Short Stories, which was published just a couple of years ago in 2018. Um, but the short story was originally published in this book, Ground Zero Nagasaki, in 2006. Um, it's a collection of short stories. They're all about um, aftermath of the uh, atomic bombings. They're all set in modern day Japan, but these various um, characters that he depicts are still trying to come to terms with um, what the bombing meant to them and still continues to mean to them. Um, so Insects features a woman named Michiko who experienced the bombing when she was 15 years old, working as a nurse in training. Um, she still has nightmares about it decades later. Um, she goes back and forth between how she feels about having reached old age. On the one hand, she is annoyed because there's a lot of unsavory stuff that comes with the getting old. But on the other hand, um, she knows there were a lot of people she knows who didn't get to live to the age that she is now. Um, so lots of, lots of internal struggle there. So about the author of this piece, um, Sera Yuichi was born uh, Akitoshi Nakamura in Nagasaki in 1958. And this was about 13 years after the city was bombed. So he was not alive for the bombings, but of course they had an undeniable effect on the culture. So I think he's, I think he's good to write about him still, even if he wasn't there. Uh, he graduated from the Nagasaki University of Education and he spent some time working for the Nagasaki city government before making his authorial debut under the pen name actually his pen name up there, um, Sera Yuichi, with a work called Geronimo's Cross, for which he received the Bungakukai Prize for New Writers in 1995. He received the Akutagawa Prize for his work Holy Water in 2001, and then in 2007, he was awarded both the Itose Literary Prize and the Tanizaki Junichiro Prize for Ground Zero Nagasaki, this guy right here. Um, his work is pretty well received both in Japan and internationally, he served for a time as the director of the Nagasaki Atomic Bomb Museum, and he is still around today. I don't know if he's still writing things, but he's still around. So make him proud, I hope, by reading his piece. The bright green grasshopper comes crawling up my blood-stained calf, its square jaws munching at the skin that flaps there like a leaf. It turns its long, narrow face towards me and examines me with its expressionless compound eyes. Are you still alive? It asks. I wake up screaming. From the silence around me, I realize it must still be the middle of the night. I want to throw myself into somebody's arms. I shut my eyes, but it's no use. I'm awake. A surge of images from the past comes back to life, vivid and unstoppable. What a miserable business it is, getting old. Are you still alive? 60 years have passed since I was asked that question. At the time, I had no idea who was talking. I couldn't even tell if it was a man or a woman. I can hear the voice even now. Are you still alive? calling to me like a grasshopper, a fly, or one of the creatures that crawl up on the earth. There's no sense of desperation or panic in the question. It isn't saying, are you hurt? Don't die. The tone is more like someone asking, are you still awake? There's something dopey and amiable about it. I had just paused to catch my breath after crawling out of the rubble on my hands and knees when I saw the grasshopper flitting, apparently unscathed, among the ruins. It must have been carried here by the blast of the explosion. This must be the thing that was speaking to me, I thought a crack-brained idea that would never have occurred to me normally. I think I may have even replied, yes, thanks, I'm still alive. After that, I lost consciousness again. I have no idea how much time passed. My next memories of being picked up in someone's arms and then moving as if swept downstream to the shelter of a brick wall that had escaped destruction. I don't recall much else about that day. One thing I do remember is ants, swarms of black ants scurrying back and forth between pools of blood scattered among the shards of brick and glass. The strange thought occurred to me that this great army of ants had carried or dragged me along. I saw a body that had split open at the abdomen. Who was it? I was too scared to look at the face. Gooey wet intestines spilled out like noodles. A knot of what might have been a tapeworm squirmed around the open wound. I was 15 years old and training to be a nurse. Trembling, I saw with my own eyes the reality that insects and creepy crawlies are everywhere around us. In the trees and bushes, under the eaves of houses, in the earth beneath our feet, and even inside our bodies. All around me were the faces of people crushed in the rubble, but my first emotion wasn't exactly sadness. The human world was over, I thought, and the world of the insects was about to take its place. It was the arrival of another postcard from Reiko that had made me dream of the green insect again. I reached up and felt for the light switch by the pillow. The sleeve of my nightgown fell to my shoulder and a whiff of body odor rose from my armpit. 
I remembered the faint smell of mildew my grandmother used to give off long ago. If I rub at the back of my hand, I can feel a hard strand of narrow, sinewy bone. The skeleton is beginning to emerge from beneath my skin, and the blotches and blemishes are spreading. I am an old woman now, and I don't have much time left. But death, I feel, is still some distance away. My periods came to an end long ago, but a warm-blooded woman still lurks inside this decrepit body, threatening to come crawling to the surface. Rolling onto my stomach, I switched on the light and picked up Reiko's postcard from the tatami where I had left it the night before. Dear Machiko, I hope this finds you well. Last month, I spent another enjoyable week at the hot spring in Kanawa. It's been 15 years since I moved here, and I know a lot of the people at the resort by now. We sit and soak for hours, chatting away and quite forgetting the time. There's nothing like a long, refreshing soak on a hot day. And that first sip of beer after a long bath, it's heaven when the evening sun glints on the surface of the water. Why don't you come out and visit? We could have a good soak together and talk about the past. It's 15 years now since he died, and there aren't many friends left with whom I could share memories of the good old times. Maybe you could tell me about a side of him I never knew. Best wishes, Ryko. What a peaceful old age she's having. How can she be so relaxed and cheerful? Anger welled up inside me. I poured some water from the jug and gulped it down, still lying on my stomach. The timer had switched off the air conditioner, and the house felt hot and humid. The blood had rushed to my head. I threw the thin blanket off the futon and sat up in bed. Leave me alone, I shouted, brushing away the gray hair clinging to my cheeks. Things are not over between him and me. There is such a thing as never-ending love. Even 15 years after his death, the longing for him still burns inside me. Most of the time, it's just a small flickering light, like the dying embers in the ruins of a burnt-out city. But sometimes, late at night, it still bursts into flame and scorches my heart. Tell me, Holy Mother, why was I the only one who didn't die that day, buried under the rubble? Of the five trainee nurses in the hospital, why was I the only one to survive? Why did my parents and my four brothers and sisters have to die? Did no one ask them the same question I was asked? Are you still alive? If only a grasshopper or an ant or a tapeworm had been on hand to speak to them, maybe they too would have made it out alive. I heard the low whine of a mosquito by my ear, drawn by the sweat that coated my skin. I'll brush them off if they're buzzing near my cheek, but I can't bring myself to swat them or kill them with coils. Every living thing on this earth, however insignificant, has had to go, excuse me, has had to struggle to survive. I find it moving to think of all they've endured to get this far. Sometimes I even feel like saying a little prayer for them, though it's unlikely Our Lady or Jesus would care much about a lovely mosquito. I was wide awake now, with a dull headache somewhere deep inside my skull. I turned on the air conditioning and sat with my hands in my lap and my eyes closed, arching my back like a cat and letting the cool air blow into my face. It was no good. Sleep was out of the question. I got up and went to sit in front of my little altar to the Virgin Mary. No light came in through the curtains. Morning was still some time off. I struck a match and lit the two large candles on the altar. I love the soft light of the candles, warmer than a light bulb, but not as bright as sunlight. It's a mellow kind of light, like a small beacon between this world and the next. In candlelight, sharp edges are soothed, softened. Mary's round cheeks and the folds in the veil of blue fabric that covered her hair stood out in the subtle light. Our Father who art in heaven, calm this anger in my heart. Take away the jealous thoughts that make me hate Rego. I put my hands together and prayed. I felt the darkness wash over me, the same darkness in which our ancestors spent their lives for so many generations. It brought me a little peace of mind. Tell me, Holy Mother, did they struggle like this against hatred and anger when they prayed to you in secret? Did they too suffer from the sin of envy? A chain of prayers joins me to those people. We are all linked together like the beads on a rosary. It won't be long now before I take my place on the chain. I moved my face closer and saw what looked like some lint under Mary's lower eyelid. My eyesight has never really recovered from the operation I had for cataracts. Without my glasses, everything is blurred. It's like being underwater. Most of the time, it doesn't bother me. I've seen enough of this world already. I rarely watch TV and don't read the papers either. Often, I don't even use my glasses when I'm at home, but I needed them now. I took a pair out of the drawer of the simple desk I use as an altar. When I looked again with them on, I could see a mosquito perched quite still under one of Mary's eyes. Despite the slippery surface of the porcelain, it seemed to have no trouble staying put. It was probably the same mosquito I'd heard buzzing in the dark a few minutes earlier. I watched it stretching out its hindmost legs, first the left, then the right, as it trained to shake the numbness out of them. Its belly was red and swollen. Suddenly, it fell from there onto the white cloth that covered the altar. Maybe it had sucked out too much blood and couldn't support its own weight, or it had been stunned by the thin smoke from the candles. The mosquito lay there upside down for a moment, 
then kicked its legs and flew off into the darkness. I offered a prayer of thanks to Our Lady, and as I crossed myself, I felt a slight itch in my arm. I looked down to find a red bump there and impressed the sign of the cross on it with a fingernail. So that is all from Serai Yuichi. Um, Bethany Roberts will bring our last reading of the evening, and then Hunter will have our closing remarks. Good evening. Um, my name is Bethany, and I am currently a second year student here at Missouri Southern. I'm pursuing a double major in literature studies and professional technical writing, as well as a minor in creative writing. Um, I am a member of the honors program on campus, as well as Phi Eta Sigma, and as of this semester, Sigma Tau Delta. Um, I live here in Joplin and work as a piano teacher to some local students, and I complete what would be considered volunteer work at Apostolic Revival Church every week. After I graduate from Southern, I hope to pursue a graduate degree and a career as a full-time writer and minister. Before Southern, however, and way early in my high school years, my friends and I were really interested in anime and in Japan in general, so I have personally been absolutely thrilled about everything that's been happening in our Japan semester so far. I'm especially excited to share Drive My Car by Haruki Murakami with you tonight. So Haruki Murakami was born on January 12th, 1949 in Kyoto, Japan. In 1973, he studied drama at Waseda University in Tokyo, where he met his wife, Yoko. The couple went on to open up Peter Cat, which served as a coffee house by day and a jazz bar by night in Kokobunji, Tokyo for seven years. Murakami sojourned in Europe for several years in the late 1980s, and in 1991, he moved to the United States. While teaching at Princeton University from 1991 to 1993 and Tufts University from 93 to 95, Murakami wrote one of his most ambitious novels known as The Wind-Up Bird Chronicle, a book devoted in part to depicting Japanese militarism on the Asian continent as a nightmare. Right after completing this novel, Murakami returned to Japan in 95 prompted by the Kobe earthquake and by the sarin gas attack carried out by the AUM Shinrikyo religious sect on a Tokyo subway. It was the aftermath of this earthquake and gas attack that prompted Murakami to write Underground in 1997. This work consisted of his interviews with surviving victims as well as a member of the religious cult responsible. As powerful and impactful as his nonfiction works are though, Murakami is well known for his fictional novels. His first novel, Hear the Wind Sing, won the Gunzu Literature Prize for budding writers in 1979. He has written at least 10 novels total, three short story collections, and an illustrated novella. Many of his novels have themes and titles that invoke classical music, and some of them take their titles from songs. Murakami grew up reading a range of works by American writers, such as Kurt Vonnegut, and he is often distinguished from other Japanese writers by his Western influences. From the start, his writing was characterized by images and events that the author himself found difficult to explain, but which seemed to come from the inner recesses of his memory. Some argued that this ambiguity, far from being off-putting, was one reason for his popularity with readers, especially young ones, who were bored with the self-confessions that formed the mainstream of contemporary Japanese literature. Tonight, I have the privilege of reading an excerpt from one of Murakami's short stories known as Drive My Car. From the beginning, Kafku had been able to feel something approaching affection for the man. His name was Takatsuki, and he was a tall, good-looking fellow, the classic romantic lead. He was in his early 40s and not an especially skilled actor, nor did he have what one could call a distinctive presence. His range of roles was limited. As a general rule, he played nice guys, although sometimes a touch of melancholy would cloud his otherwise cheerful profile. He had a loyal following among middle-aged women. Kafki bumped into him on occasion in the green room at the TV studio. Some six months after his wife's death, Takatsuki came up to, the, to introduce himself and express his condolences. Your wife and I were in a film together once. I owed her a lot, Takatsuki said humbly. Kafku thanked him. As far as he knew at that point, chronologically speaking, this man was the last of his wife's string of lovers. It was soon after the end of their affair that his wife had gone to the hospital for tests and been diagnosed with advanced uterine cancer. Forgive me, but I'd like to ask a favor, Kafku said when the formalities had concluded. 
This was his chance to broach what he had in mind. Is there something I can do? If it's all right with you, I'd like, to, I'd like you to grant me some of your time to talk about my wife, maybe have a few drinks and remember her together. She often spoke of you. Tukatsky looked surprised, perhaps shocked would be more accurate. His immaculate eyebrows inched together as he closely, cautiously studied Kafka's face. He seemed to be trying to discern what, if anything, might lie behind the invitation, but he could read no intent in the older man's expression. All he saw was the kind of stillness you might expect from someone who had recently lost his wife of many years, like the surface of a pond after the ripples had spread and gone. I was only hoping to talk about my wife with someone who knew her, Kafki added. To tell the truth, it can get kind of rough when I'm sitting at home all by myself. I know it's an imposition on you, though. Tukatsky looked relieved. His relationship with the man's wife did not seem to be under suspicion. It's no imposition at all. I'd be happy to make time for something like that. I just hope I won't bore you. A faint smile rose to his lips as he said these words, and the corners of his eyes crinkled with compassion, an altogether charming expression. If I were a middle-aged woman, thought Kofke, my cheeks would be turning pink right now. Tukatsky mentally flipped through the schedule he kept in his head. I think I have plenty of time tomorrow night. Do you have other plans? Kofke replied that he was also free then. He was struck by how easy it was to read Tukatsky's emotions. The man was transparent. If he looked into his eyes long enough, Kofke thought, he could probably see the wall behind him. There was nothing warped, nothing nasty hardly the type to dig a deep hole at night and wait for someone to fall in. But neither, in all likelihood, was he, await- was he a man destined to achieve greatness as an actor. Where shall we meet? asked Tukatsky. I'll leave it to you, Kafku said. Tell me a place and I'll be there. Tukatsky named a well-known bar in Ginza. He would reserve a booth, he said, so they could talk frankly without having to worry about being overheard. Kafku knew the spot. They shook hands goodbye. Tukatsky's hand was soft, with long, slender fingers. His palm was warm and slightly damp, as if he had been sweating. Perhaps he was nervous. After he left, Kofki sat down on a chair in the green room, opened his right hand, and stared hard at his palm. That sensation left by the handshake was still fresh. That hand, those fingers, had caressed his wife's naked body. Slowly and deliberately exploring every nook and cranny, he closed his eyes and breathed deeply, What in heaven's name was he trying to do? He felt that whatever it was, he had no choice but to go ahead and do it. As he sipped single malt whiskey in the booth at the bar, Kafku came to one conclusion. Tukatsky was still deeply attached to his wife. He had not yet grasped the immutable fact of her death, that the flesh she had known had become a pile of charred bone and ash. Kafku could understand the way he felt. When Tukatsky's eyes grew misty recalling her, he wanted to reach out to console him. The man was quite incapable of hiding his emotions. Kafku sensed that he could trip him up with a trick question if he so chose, induce him to confess everything. Judging from the way Tukatsky spoke, Kafku's wife had been the one to call a halt to their affair. It's best we not meet anymore, was probably how she had put it. And she had followed through on her words. A relationship of several months brought to a sudden close. Nothing long and drawn out. As far as Kafku knew, that was the pattern of all her amours, if they could be called that. But it seems that Tukatsky couldn't handle such a quick and casual break. He must have been hoping for a more permanent bond. Tukatsky had tried to visit her during the final phase of her cancer, but had been flatly refused. After she was admitted to the city hospital, she saw almost no one. Other than hospital staff, only three people were permitted in her room. Her mother, her sister, and Kafku. Tukatsky seemed filled with regret that he had not been able to see her during that time. He had not even known she had cancer until a few weeks before her death. The news had hit him like a thunderbolt and still hadn't entirely sunk in. Kafku could relate to that. Yet their feelings were far from identical. Kafku had watched his wife waste away day by day as the end drew near and had plucked her pure white bones from the ashes at the crematorium. He had passed through all the stages. That made a huge difference. As they reminisced about his wife, it hit Kafku that he was the one doing most of the consoling. How would his wife feel if she observed them sitting together like this? The idea aroused a strange emotion in Kafku, but he doubted the dead could think or feel anything. In his opinion, that was one of the great things about dying. One other thing was becoming clear. Tukatsky drank way too much. There were many heavy drinkers in Kafku's line of work. Why were actors so susceptible to alcohol? So he could tell Tukatsky's drinking was not the healthy, wholesome kind. 
In Kafka's considered opinion, there were two types of drinkers, those who drink to enhance their personalities and those who sought to rid themselves of something. Tchaikovsky clearly belonged to the latter group. Kafka could not tell what it was he was trying to get rid of, maybe weakness in his character or trauma from his past, or perhaps something in the present was causing his problem, or maybe a combination of all those things. Whatever it was, he was trying like mad either to forget it or to numb the pain it caused, which made it necessary to drink. For every drink Kafka took, Tchaikovsky drowned down to two and a half, quite a pace. Then again, he might have just been tense. He was, after all, sitting face to face with the husband of the woman with whom he had been secretly having an affair. That was bound to put him in on, on edge. But Kafka guessed there was more to it. A man like Tchaikovsky could probably only drink this way. Kafka drank at a careful, steady rate while keeping a close eye on his companion. When the number of glasses mounted and the younger man began to relax, Kafka asked him if he was married. I've been married 10 years and have a seven-year-old son, Tchaikovsky answered. Due to certain circumstances, however, he and his wife had been living apart since the previous year. A divorce was likely, and the question of who would get custody of the child loomed large. What he wanted to avoid at any cost was being unable to visit his son freely. He needed the boy in his life. He showed Kafka his child's photograph, a handsome, sweet-looking kid. Like most habitual drinkers, the more alcohol Tchaikovsky drank, the more loose-lipped he became. He volunteered information he shouldn't have without being asked. Kafka took on the role of listener, interjecting an encouraging word here and there to keep his companion talking and offering carefully selected words of comfort when consolation seemed appropriate. All the while, he was amassing as much information as he could. Kafka acted as though he had only the warmest feelings for Tchaikovsky. This was not a hard thing to do. He was a born listener, and he did truly like the younger man. In addition, the two of them had one big thing in common. Both were still in love with the same beautiful dead woman. Despite the differences in their relationships with her, neither man had been able to get over that loss. They had a lot to talk about. Why don't we meet again, Kafka suggested when the evening was winding down. It was a pleasure talking with you. I haven't felt this good for a long time. Kafka had taken care of the bar tab in advance. It seemed not to have dawned on Tchaikovsky that someone would have to pay. Alcohol led him to forget a lot of things. Some were doubtless very important. Certainly, Tchaikovsky said, looking up from his glass, I'd love to get together again. Talking to you has taken a weight off my chest. I feel that our meeting was somehow preordained, Kafka said. Perhaps my late wife brought us together. There was some truth to that. They exchanged cell phone numbers, then they shook hands and parted. Thank you. And now I'd like to invite Hunter back to the podium. First of all, I would like to give a huge thank you to Dr. Jensen and all of our fantastic readers this evening. Thank you for taking part in this event with us as well, everyone who has come and heard all of us read tonight, as well as everyone who has joined us online. We really appreciate uh, you all coming to this event and celebrating in Japanese literature with us. Please don't forget to join us next Thursday at uh, Spiva Library, room 413A, where we will be discussing uh, George Takei's They Called Us Enemy. This is our third and final book club of the semester as well. And on behalf of Sigma Tau Delta, thank you for attending our reading.